to the third day of the live program conference. Uh, we have a keynote, Professor Sally Jane Norman, Professor in Performance Technologies. So if the first talk was about live coding and the second about maybe computer science and coding, now we focus on the liveness, I guess. Um, and Sally Jane is um, at the University of Sussex part of the new Sussex uh, Humanities Lab and works at the music department as well in the School of Media, Film and Music. With a long history of doing interesting things in various uh, European institutions. Uh, but I guess I'll hand over to you. Thanks, though. Thank you. Well, thanks, Thor and Alex, for this wonderful opportunities. It's a, really, it's a really fantastic event and I feel very privileged. Um, and of course, uh, as is uh, the kind of classic formula on, on the third day, on the third day, <laughs> not quite dead, but um, there's been a lot that's come through that I'm going to try and bounce off of rather, rather crudely. So this is going to be something of a mishmash and I'm, I would like to keep it tight time-wise because I would really like to try and allow some time for conversation. I'm hoping this will spark some discussion. Um, also, it's formidable pass uh, coming up on the, on the back of, um, I can't do anything like what Stephen <laughs> did yesterday, and I certainly can't do what Julian did the day before. Um, but I'm going to try and uh, take you into perhaps more my performing arts and theatre side of the story. Um, so. Please uh, wave at me if, if I'm going too fast, if it's gibberish, although speed might not be a problem in that case. Um, and I will try and, and, and rip through some, some material that hopefully isn't too dense. So my work as a performance uh, theorist, uh, sometime practitioner, historian, um, deals with uh, embodiment, expressive gesture, staging and framing techniques, um, and I define theatre very broadly and in the eyes of orthodox theatre scholars quite blasphemously um, as being an arena for projecting and poetically modelling all kinds of liveness. So this ranges from the artificial lives coming through ancient techniques like puppetry, juggling, magic. I'm very interested in instrumental dexterity in these questions of cognitive load that Tim referred to wonderfully yesterday. Um, but I'm also interested in, in artificial life and in theatre as, as a kind of an arena for exploring artificial life in terms of um, software, hardware, wetware and their hybrids. So I, I, I try and write in these different areas and it's, and it's very uncomfortable but I think I, I'm drawn to the discomfort zones of these things that kind of fall between the cracks. Um, I'm not going to try and define liveness. Uh, it's a can of very live worms. <laughs> um, but you know, Alex yesterday mentioned Auslander's liveness performance in a mediatized culture, which I think is relevant to some of the exchanges we're having here about the, the different degrees of, of presence and mediatization at work and our concepts of liveness, especially dealing with, with performance media. Um, and I would also suggest that um, Stanjek and Pikut's uh, paper uh, on deadness, technologies of the intermundane, um, is a really interesting one, which perhaps raises some of the criticality that Jeff was uh, itching towards yesterday. Um, they talk about the capitalists cashing in on performance necro worlds. Um, the, um, this is a way perhaps that we might sharpen our reflection on the liveness of live coding. We're not just resuscitating dead performers, we're doing something that is inherently non-capturable, perhaps. So there's, a, there's an interesting discourse in Stanjek and Piekut about the status of um, accelerationist post-industrial cultures and what, these, what this is doing to our readings of liveness. Um, the mastering of liveness, literally post-production mastering. I mean, that is as deadly as it gets. Um, so are we looking to try and offset live coding as an act of defiance or resistance in that it does perhaps have a unique vitality um, it playfully messes with temporal systems that elsewhere are diff driven by very different profitability goals. Um, or are they so different after all? And this is another critical question that we need to be raising. And I'll flip to a, um, I've quoted a, a colleague and a 
she's an artist and she's a coder. She created a wonderful piece of distributed um, creative software called Keyworks. She had Dorif. So this is perhaps the critical slant that it's interesting to bear in mind, that the playfulness of art and design, research creation, this is for you, Alan, <laughs> has much to offer in the open discourse and shared praxis between rigorous scientific methodologies and the crapshoot of entrepreneurialism. Too early in the morning to pronounce that one. But that same playfulness, the dynamic relations that emerge through interplay, have already been subsumed by the system and are driving it. Um, so we need to be alertly aware that the ontology of play and interplay in this uncommon ground, has, uh, th we have to be aware that it's shifted, and, and that's an important thing to bear in mind. So just quickly, a couple of words about where I'm coming from, apart from the kind of theoretical uh, practices or, or discourses that I'll allude to. I've been exploring performance and expressive gesture for a couple of decades, um, and I look at it as a means to creatively flesh out digitally extended spaces. So I work, as I said, with puppeteers, with musicians, with dancers. I'm interested in specific corporeal skills. Um, and my first motion capture workshop, which is, of course, not live coding, this was at the International Institute of Puppetry in Charleville-Mézières, which is on the French-Belgian border in 1994. Wow. Um, and basically, at that time, uh, puppeteers were using motion capture to generate what one might call digital shadows, electronic shadows. So it was, a, it was a rudimentary form of mirroring. Of course, you could play with the shadows. You could extend them. You could slow them down. You could speed them up. But it was a deforming mirror process. But then, and I've been doing these kinds of things over the years, but so that's another one from Charleville. Um, so we used optical and magnetic motion capture systems so that we could compare the infrastructural differences and nuances of technical systems. But this one, sorry for the quality of the photos, but this is kind of archaeology. Um, I was a research associate on European framework projects for three years at the ZKM, and I managed to pull together a workshop with EU funding um, looking at these questions of real gestures in virtual environments, so always these notions of hybridization. And here, the um, flower that's up there, this computer graphics flower, has been designed by a guy called Mont Linterman, who um, is a, a procedural kind of expert. He works on modeling natural growth systems. Um, so he's you know, a usual SIGGRAPH contender for the best morphogenetic systems. Genetic algorithms basically use it, used to emulate and, and, and drive kinds of natural processes. And this flower then um, has been mapped to the puppeteer, uh, his, his motion capture points, um, so he's able to manipulate it. But Burnt in real time is sitting on the stage as well, and he's actually tweaking the points of the template, um, the flower uh, points of the template, so that he's giving them more or less autonomy while Ramon, the puppeteer, is, is working. So there's, there's a very interesting relationship happening here. The flower is, is a static entity. Bernd does morphogenetic stuff, um, but if we tried to do that in 1998 with what was actually an, an evolving flower, we'd have really blown the system. But what's interesting is that there was a, there was a very different dynamic of interplay between <coughs> the manipulator, the human animator, actor, and this entity that had its own life. And what that created was not a mirroring, but actually a whole range of dramaturgical possibilities that went from emulation, enslavement, through to dramaturgical partnering, through to risk, through to conquest, through to threat. So there was a completely different kind of uh, terrain that was opened up by ascribing more autonomy to this, this computer-driven computer entity. The other area that's influenced my work a lot is um, STIME, the Studio for Electro-Instrumental Music in Amsterdam. Um, I was artistic co-director there from 98 to 2000, but I worked with Michel Weisswitz more or less until he died in 2008, um, unfortunately, um, and also with Joe Ryan. And STIME, as, as many of you will know, has always been obsessed with uh, this question of... of um, creative embodied ways to explore hard and software potentialities. And Mariah, who works there, I think gave us probably the best possible example of what I see as the same ethos and philosophy uh, yesterday. So this is the perspective from which I'm coming at uh, generative arts practices. I was at the Transmediala Top Lap panel in 2005, and 
I was delighted by the range of stuff that I encountered. And for me, I just thought, oh, God, this is, this is all about extensions to theatre. This is, this is performance and performativity growing. And of course, if you go back to traditional theatre technology, we've been moving from static light and sound systems through to kind of fairly pedantically preset systems, through to on-the-fly controllable systems, through to systems that we can give more or less autonomous behaviours in live performance contexts. And this is, this is you know, thousands of years of theatre technology history. Um, and the other thing that we've always done, and which I think is really, really relevant here, is that we've been upscaling and downscaling um, spaces and times. That's what theatre is for, that's what it's about. It's a place where you can mess around with scales. Um, and this, I think, responds to a very basic urge or yearning that my friend Louis Beck calls um, our yearning as creative extremophiles. Human beings are creative extremophiles, or the best of, I, I think the best of us are. Um, we, we push the edges, but we push them in, in creative ways. So, of course, we know that computational entities have long flourished in performance. Again, this is not live coding, but it's worth remembering. So the sound and light, but there are also choreographic notation systems, like this one, Rudolf von Laban's system, has been a very strong um, basis or framework for software like Tom Calvert's Life Forms. Um, this goes back to the 90s. It was developed with the dancer programmer Tekla Shippos at um, Simon Fraser University, Vancouver, which next month is hosting the Movement and Computing Workshop. Last year's edition was at IRCAM. This year's is at Simon Fraser. And so this whole, this whole arena of, um, of movement and computing and, and, and of, of life forms type um, software exploration um, is, is a very, very vigorous one. And I think there'll be a lot of live coding in Vancouver as there was at IRCAM. This is inspired work for Merce Cunningham. This is, oh, this is, sorry, that's from life forms. So you've got templates, you've got possible geometries and parts of the anatomy that you can recompile uh, to perform impossible gestures because we have gestural thinking that comes through what we normally do. If you want to do something that you don't normally do, throw it at a computer, recompile yourself, and it will come up with things that you would never have dreamt of. So this is what Moose Cunningham did with life forms. And he developed a whole new choreographic syntax and vocabulary. Um, this is Paul Kaiser's work for Cunningham using life forms, animations, um, that are projected on a scrim in front of the dancers. Um, and, of course, this technology has also influenced William Forsythe. Uh, he did this CD-ROM called Improvisation Technologies while I was at the ZKM in the 90s, um, using Laban uh, notation systems, so to look at questions of gestural amplitude and speed and, and the, the ergonomic qualities of gesture, if you like. Um, and then more recently, um, did this wonderful piece called uh, Asynchronous Objects. This is a dancer, right? Uh, but this was done with Ohio, Ohio State University, and Forsyth basically um, spawned a whole bunch of different sorts of uh, declensions of, of, of what choreographic movements could be if they were given different kinds of computational renderings, um, 3D, 2D, whatever. Another person who's done some interesting work in what, he, what that's synchronous objects again, sorry. So that's a group of dancers. Uh, and if you go onto the Foresight website, the Motion Bank, um, you can see the different types of readings and renderings that we have of live movement through this particular choreographic work. It's fascinating. Um, Jean-Francois Lapointe. No, it's not Jean-Francois, sorry, that's wrong. It's Francois Joseph, I'll have to change that. Um, is a Canadian guy who's been building this thing called choreogenetics for the last 10 years. So he's been developing generations of in silico dancers and their movement sequences are subjected to simple algorithmic processes. You can see them here. Um, repetition, translocation and conversion and this builds increasingly complex choreographic mutations. So I'm not trying to pass this stuff off as live coding, but what's important about it, I think, is that it provides new ways for us to write and manipulate movement instructions. So this opens up potential for live coding uh, processes or live coding type processes. Um, performance systems I see as being unique kinds of exosomatic organ spaces. 
So this is a term I'm borrowing from the philosopher Robert Innes. Um, it's quite a useful concept, I think, to strap onto the wonderful work by, by Perry Cook and by Don Ide. Um, in fact, last year at the live coding event at Sussex, David Ogborn gave us a fabulous kind of overview of, of, these, of these different approaches to extended biological, anatom anatomical and cognitive selves. But I, I like Innes's notion of the exosomatic organ, which he describes as a device that substitutes for, extends, and compensates for natural powers of the human body. So it can be manifest as a microscope, uh, um, a computer, a language, a loom, um, an airplane, an institution. And um, exosomatic organs, I'm quoting Innes, have their own trajectories. They have their own dynamic logics or vectorial paths. They define and predefine the grounds for the historical variability of consciousness and forms of perception and apprehension. So exosomatic organ spaces extend our senses. They ground our perceptual schemata and our co-evolving motor skills. And of course, there's a very strong iteration between these perceptual and motor skill um, developments. They construct as much as they construe what Innes calls the world at the end of the cane. This is the blind man's cane. Um, and its materiality, its rigidity, its weight, its texture serves as both probe and filter. I would suggest that as a performance practice, um, live coding's exosomatic world at the end of the cane is characterized by unique temporal dynamics. And, and we've had some really exciting insights into these temporalities. Um, thank you, Stephen. Um, and I think it's interesting here also to explore um, something that uh, Jeff Cox pointed to yesterday, Shintaro Miyazaki's microtemporalities, um, his algorithmics, defined as the interleaving of concepts of algorithm and rhythm. But also we can look back to the founding rhythm analysis of people like Henri Lefebvre, um, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's a political agenda. It's an agenda of social tuning. And this is part of what we're doing as well, I would suggest. Um, and then there's work, obviously, on the cultural industry's takeover of our temporal consciousness, the good old Adorno Horkheimer stuff, and, and more recently Bernard Stiegler. I think this kind of reflection is all relevant to our exploration of different rhythmic modalities, different forms of communitas that are being generated through live coding performance. So to create spaces for developing and collectively appreciating these performance practices, separating them out from everyday contingencies, we've been designing containment systems for thousands of years. It's a, it's a slightly brash term, but you know I, I worked for a few years in an industry where containment systems were actually quite important. Um, and I think it usefully demarcates realms of autonomy where we can co-mingle or control human and non-human actions. It's cultural apparatus. So I'm coming back to Barad's definition, um, again, that Jeff used yesterday, of an apparatus not as a mere static arrangement in the world, but as a dynamic reconfiguring of the world. So the characteristics of these containment systems, these apparatuses, their scale, their level of detail, their means for separating contents from environment, their observer positionings, these obviously affect the ways that liveness can be projected. And in turn, the very liveness of the phenomena they contain challenges their own boundaries. So this is a process of ongoing feedback. And I think we need to be looking at this um, containment system when we're trying to define where is it that a live coding performance starts and stops? Where is it that the infrastructure starts and stops? Where is it that our literacies and our, 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 our social conditionings are brought to bear in our appreciation of a live coding performance? So this, this feedback thing, um, it's something that live coding specialists and the ones I'm referencing are, are mostly in the room, um, have, have have called, um, they've, they've classified into nested loops uh, that include feedback between source code and running process, raising kind of event and concurrency questions, um, manipulation feedback between the programmer or artist and the work in progress, performance feedback, 
which involves obviously the external outputs, the um, display systems or sound projection systems. Display we use too, too idly as being an exclusively visual term, but of course uh, uh, deplicare means to unfold. You know, I think it's really unfortunate that display has been monopolized by visual culture. It's a wonderful term for sonic uh, and, and all modalities of sensory experience. But anyway, um, and then there's social feedback which encompasses audience or co-performers in a distributed system. So I want to step outside, radically outside, informatics-based practices to see how other kinds of adaptive performance systems might be seen as being open to runtime <coughs> interventions and generating real-time live feedback that affects their evolution. So if I apply, for example, these categories um, to emerging academic canons in the European performing arts, um, I might view 17th century royal choreographer Pierre Beauchamp, who was actually inventor of the classical dance framework, as being engaged in manipulation feedback. He was devising the code. He had to make it usable for and co-developable with uh, performers, including Beauchamp himself. Um, so it was constantly being refined in keeping with the performance feedback loop. Um, and then, of course, social feedback was crucial, especially at the French court. Um, it upheld relations between the dancers, fellow dancers, and audience. Um, so this is a scale question, but basically if you do some transposition, if you do some extrapolation, you can, you can, you can map these, these notions of feedback across to very different historical phenomena. Um, the, this, is, this is not actually a Beauchamp piece, this is slightly earlier, this is late, um, late 16th century, but um, gives you an idea of the, of the arena within which these different sorts of feedback were, were engaged. Here's the king, obviously, the La Place du Prince, but the, um, the aristocrats, the, the spectators who really have to see the stuff, he doesn't really have to see it because he is it. They have to see the stuff, but they have to see him. But basically what they're seeing is, is on this ground level. Um, so court dances were actually interpretations of instructions that were governed in part by obvious corporeal biomechanical limitations. There's a limit to our gestural amplitude, to our speed, to our precision. Um, and they were also pushed to their limits in the name of innovation. Um, court spectacles were luxury goods. They were only performed once, and that meant that they had to be very, very strong in terms of their innovation. They were free from the imperatives of reproducibility. You just had every single time to be absolutely brilliant. Uh, no pressure. So, and then there were kind of hardware... This is, this is one of the... Um, remappings that uh, Margaret McGowan, a, a scholar of um, court ballet, has done, where she's shown some of the incredibly elaborate kinds of patterns. These, these were monographs that were read by people in the galleries. So this is reading movement, right? This is reading code. Sometimes these were the royal monogram, and that's where everybody just swooned and applauded, of course. Otherwise, you were beheaded. Um, and then, and then there are the hardware limitations. Here's Louis at his best. Um, you know, you try and do a pirouette in those shoes. Of course, in those days, it was a very genteel and gracious turning on, on, on one's own axis. But, you know, the, these kinds of things really influenced the, 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 the flexibility and, and, the, and the vocabulary that people could use. Um, the Sun King was the ultimate live coder because he was a star, as his name suggests. Um, even if he totally fudged the vocabulary that um, his poor uh, courtiers were trying to develop <coughs> as a basis for a transmissible, transferable, um, knowledge transfer type of programmatic language. There was a notation system that was based on uh, Beauchamp's work. Here's some examples. By Feuillet, this was published in 1700. And this dominated classical dance for over 150 years. So that thing that with historical hindsight we look on as being very rigorous and congealed and frozen, it must have actually been quite adaptable and open in order to last for 150 years. Um, and the early notation systems were mere floor plans, although gradually, um, so here are some more, and then gradually as you move towards the 18th century and human beings come more ostensibly into the picture, um, they get brought into the engravings. Um, reproduction techniques, of course, printing techniques have a lot to do with this as well. We're, we're in, a, we're in a, an ecology of resources that is well beyond the actual performance space per se. Um, 
Yet all of these traces, and we've got quite a few of them, won't ever let us know how easily dancer choreographers could really rework the classical code. And I think it's, it's difficult today, by the same token, to see how freely live coders develop and navigate their programming languages, or how distinctive their respective systems ultimately are. Um, Nick Collins yesterday came up with this wonderful codeo morphology term, borrowing from Dennis Smalley. Um, I'm waiting for a codeo rodeo, Alex. Um, but I, I think that uh, Nick talked about a taxonomic approach to live coding uh, practices. We've got a corpus now that allows us to, to devise this. And if we look at what we've seen over the last two days, we've seen stuff that's based on, that's based on games. We've seen models that draw on tangible interfaces, um, repurposed instruments. We've seen a whole range of stuff. And I think a, taxonom a taxonomic approach to this would be quite valuable. Um, and this would perhaps help us to see where it is that um, canons or academic implications or reproducibility imperatives are kicking in, if they are. They may not be, but, you know, let's not kid ourselves. So whether we're dealing with the 17th or the 21st century, in either instance, how far can artists depart from recognised frameworks whilst ensuring compelling legibility, as opposed to bloody boring legibility, of dynamic processes um, for their own engagement, and for their audiences, and which audiences are we talking about? Are we talking about code literate audiences? Are we talking about general cultures? What are we talking about? How conditioned are feedback loops by performance infrastructure, by the types and emplacements of the projection systems, the display systems, the audience positioning? I thought that the, um, I thought that the stained glass figure probably had the best view of all the other night at the left bank, <laughs> and a few of us commented on that. And, and how far is this being influenced by the specific socialities of practitioners and publics, including the fact that we take into account the fact that there's a guy up there, or a reproduction of a guy, watching all this going on. And we, we're, not, we're not oblivious to it. We're not, it's, it's not innocent. There's nothing innocent about this. So I want to turn to some more recent pre-computational still performance work by a Bauhaus artist, um, Oskar Schlemmer, who uh, lived from... 1888 to 1943, sadly died too young. But Schlemmer drew on mathematical, experiential, and affective principles to create choreographic programming that some people have described as corporeal calculus, which is interesting because calculus is the mathematical study of change. And um, he built these kinds of uh, systems and, and schemata. So egocentrische Raumlinie is when the, the figure is generating its own space. Um, whereas this one, figure on Ramlinietio, the figure is, is subservient to the, to the vectors and the prescriptive characteristics of a, of a mathematical space. And, and Schlemmer was always torn between these two models, and I think, I think they're quite interesting to look at. But he also, so here's, here's a real life example, because sometimes when you just see this, you think, oh yeah, that's easy to do, it's a pretty picture. But actually, this guy, Werner Seedhoff, was a really amazing dancer. He wasn't just a pretty picture. And there was an incredibly tight correlation between what Schlemmer was doing diagrammatically and what people were doing physically uh, at the Dessau Bauhaus. Um, and then he devised these kinds of typologies, these gestural typologies. And these bear their own kind of movement vectors. Um, they have their own kind of propensities for certain kinds of linear or circular movement. Um, they, they can be deployed, they can be modulated, they can be combined, and, and, and they can express new kinds of movement potentialities. So a lot of the experimental work that Schlemmer did um, involved uh, taking movement sequences and, and literally processing them through these different types of figures and seeing how they were deployed, how they were modulated. He was building up vocabularies. Um, so they were, they were movement sequences that were constructed and reconstructed in the course of their execution, which uncannily aligns with some of the things we say about live coding. Um, and, you know, again, not just pretty pictures. Using extensions, using uh, prostheses, whether they're sticks or hoops or a mixture, these, these all inflect our movements. These are, these are strong theatrical examples, but let's think about the perhaps more subtle theatrical examples that we're sometimes blind to that are up there on the stage 
when somebody is doing a, a live coding performance. Uh, there, there are what John Bowers calls instrumental ecologies. There are, there are playful ecologies that we use and that we operate. And it's good to be uh, perhaps aware of these. And Schlimmer also um, worked on the influence of materials on movement. So this is the metal dance, which had a very specific kind of gestural uh, pattern to it. It was, it was a metal gesture. It was a heavy metal gesture. And this is the glass dance. You know, and this was all tinkling. And I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting, because basically going through geometries, going through materials, uh, there is a kind of a, 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 a dictating or a prescription or a, at least an, a, a suggestion of constraints and codes that are just there to be played around with and eventually to be broken. The, the other thing about Schlemmer that I think is really important, and I'm glad that these photos, I think, show it better than the diagrams that some people remain completely obsessed by and they forget about the human realities. Um, Schlemmer's dancers were fluid human elements and he was very attached to that. A lot of his colleagues were working on mechanical, strictly mechanical theatre and dance. And um, Emma Cocker has talked about uh, the artist's body, which might be conceived as a processing machine, acting out algorithms and performing code. But like the artist's body that Emma, uh, uh, whose, whose um, arbitrariness and whose idiosyncratic uh, uh, behaviors Emma emphasizes, Schlemmer insisted on the, the, the non-fixedness of human engagement, its openness to inflection and interpretation. And actually, Slub talk about the human thread. You even talk about um, the homemade quality of your music in one of the texts, which I really love, um, which is granted by expressive control over the software. And I think this is, a, this is quite an analogous situation. So basically, Schlemmer's performances are devised and often improvised with corporeal grammars, modulated by a whole bunch of factors. We've seen some of them. Um, they can be exogenous factors uh, coming in from the outside, or they can be ascribed or innate gestural typologies, um, group interactions. They can evolve freely. Their cues are partly programmed. These might be learned or scripted gestural sequences. They might be kinetic behaviors dictated by geometries or materials. And there are also partly spontaneous responses to programmatic constraints. This is improvised interactive programming. However much Schlemmer may have rehearsed, some of his pieces, and he did. And his performance notation systems were inspired by, oh, okay, I'll get, I'll get there shortly, by court ballet patterns that were read from raised viewing galleries. He knew his, this, he knew his history. Um, so he used color codes and diagrammatic marking for floor trajectory notations that resemble actual motion traces. So this is the triadic ballet, which is one of his most famous pieces. And so all of the costumes were basically dictating the gestural and, and kinetic typologies of the dancers. And here you can see the kind of work that went into looking at um, how graphically these, these systems were going to unfurl their innate mathematics. Um, and here's some of the notation stuff. So Schlemmer actually conjectured, conjectured about notation that was made by trails deposited by the dancers' feet. And he also talked about space that was filled, that might be filled, with a soft, pliable substance in which figures generated by movements might harden as negative sculptural forms, producing 3D relics he likened to technical organisms, very similar to what Forsyth's managed to do with contemporary technology. And again, I, I point to Emma's work, which I, I think is really wonderful, on... Um, New, new notational systems and the need for us to actually evolve and devise notational systems that actually meaningfully convey what are novel types of gestural practices, gestural practices that involve extremely hybrid environments and agencies, alien agencies, as Chris Salter calls them. So these notation systems of which Schlemmer could only dream um, and that are now fully instantiated, um, that mobilize uh, ideas of live capture or sampling of physical activity per se comprise something that Brian Rotman's described as asymbolic writing. He contrasts this to the symbolic writing of alphabetical or mathematical systems. Um, uh, Rotman is a philosopher, mathematician, and semiotician. Um, he 
He talks about trace and residues. This is a writing that has to do with trace residues, echoings, and ghostings. It has to do with second and third and nth degrees of what I call registers of presence, which I think are needed to capture something of the complexities of live performance as a crucible for temporal meltdowns. And the, the, the notion of the theatre as a crucible is a, is a very Arto notion. He talks about a place where we trample the traditional systems of, of, of disparate and discrete bodies and languages, and we, we put them into this, we throw them into this crucible. They are dismembered and remembered. Um, so live coding performance is productively caught between the manipulation of symbols, alphanumeric character command lines, and physical corporeal interventions. And I think uh, Mariah and Chris um, have, have shown us this beautifully. <laughs> so maybe Rotman's reflection on symbolic and asymbolic systems and on what he calls gesturo haptics might help us think through the embodied specificities of live performance. So if you're editing a source code to modify a running process, um, this obviously means that you're using a formal language, a symbolic system in short, whose grammatical structure embeds syntactical and semantic requirements. That's easy to say. Um, Nelson Goodman compares the semantic and syntactic properties of analog notation systems. His example is a gauge whose needle rotating clockwise over a non-differentiated surface roughly indicates rising pressure. So he contrasts this system with digital systems and takes the example of a gauge that records the successive insertions of coins in a toy bank, or what he calls a dime bank. Um, so this is from his Languages of Art. And I'm wondering whether the exosomatic organ space of live coding doesn't mobilize both kinds of systems. In other words, the abstract autonomously evolving processes are necessarily and excitingly entangled with human input that cannot be reduced, we know, to the strictly computable or computational. So when code is deployed or transduced by programmed, sensor-laden physical objects instead of exclusively by a computer keyboard and screen, this further highlights the ergonomics aspects of the relationship. And maybe this is where, Stephen, I, I was very taken with your um, evocation of secondary syntax, and I was wondering whether we, we mightn't be thinking about um, um, nested language loops and... and and nested linguistic modalities, as well as nested feedback loops. Um, Etienne Benvenis, the, the great linguist, compa compares existential modalities of the schema, a fixed form realized and viewed in the same way as an object, with rhythmos, which designates the form in the instant that it is assumed by what is moving, mobile, fluid, the form of that which does not have organic necessity. Sorry, organic consistency. It's the form as improvised, momentary, changeable. So there's something very close here to, to the kinds of um, language that we've been using to describe live coding, it seems. Um, there are lots of wonderful reflections, and I'm cutting this very, very short, on the language or the languages of liveness. Um, Richard Doyle's book, On Beyond Living, Rhetorical Transformations of the Life Sciences, talks about the curious chiasmus or folding between vitality and textuality that accompanies, for example, the emergence of, of DNA code. It's, it's a fascinating thing to look at as a parallel, to, perhaps, to some of the notions of liveness we're trying to associate with live coding performance. So I think that these kinds of differentiating concepts or frameworks, um, I've been looking at them to look at gesture, its eventual preservation, or its vital non-preservation, um, they, they've got a lot of scope for development in the live coding domain. Um, philosopher Etienne Souriau, and I'm sorry to be throwing all these names at you, but I will write them down, <laughs> um, has written about the need for us to get beyond thinking in terms of exclusivist, hierarchized modes of being, and instead to embrace ideas of existential pluralism. And I think, again, Stephen, this was something I, I, I thought I was hearing coming through your... Your, your beautiful um, categorizations of, of temporal structures. and um, So these, these Etienne Souriau's existential pluralism foregrounds the relational dynamics that operate across different modes of existence rather than discretized existences 
or modes of existence as such. And I think this notion on the relational dynamics is a, is a really valuable one. So to conclude as a performance, to conclude as a performance historian, um, <laughs> I see live codings striving for rhythms and patterns ever closer to the bone of that thing we call real time, um, striving for creative fusions of flesh and symbol, or what Guattari calls machinic processuality, a beautiful term that comes out of chaos, chaosmosis. I see this as part of an ar archaic yet very vibrant theatrical quest. We're a pattern-hungry species, and we're forever searching for signals, for frequencies and scalabilities that can extend our exosomatic organs, which are having to deal with a very steeply evolving environment. So for me, live coding is about creatively engineering our relations to time. It's an activity at the core of all live art practices, perhaps if nothing else, to bluff the intractable linearity of our own lifelines and of my own 30-minute <laughs> intervention. So I'll leave it there. Here, here are some of the people I've quoted, and, and I should really very uh, strongly acknowledge all of the people, uh, especially who were at last year's uh, Sussex um, Symposium, who, who were wonderfully um, rich source of information for me, but so many of you in this room as well. So thank you. So I think bringing the body into the discussion of life coding um, balances it in a way that it kind of um, allows us to understand each other. I think you're providing a lot of language which will um, help us uh, resolve these little conflicts which we saw yesterday. So yeah, I, I haven't got a question. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, thank you, Alex. And I, I mean, I, I feel as though the the movement, this feedback movement between the kind of performance that I'm dealing with and the kinds of uh, coding uh, skills and performances that people here are dealing with is, is an incredibly productive, iterative kind of system because I, I feel as though my um, probably very clumsy and totally non-computational and non-discretizable uh, notions of time have, have just taken a, a very healthy hammering by reading and rereading and rereading uh, work that a lot of you people have produced, and, and um, I think we need it. We need it from both ends. Uh, but I do think it's very much to do with uh, with with coming to terms with with this exponentially rescaled hybridity. And you know, entanglement's a good word. Barad uses it. It's actually the subtitle, isn't it, of her book, uh, "Meeting the Universe Halfway: The Entanglement of Quantum Mechanics" or something. And then Chris um, Chris Salter's Entangled Performance book is a really interesting one, as is his Alien Agencies book. So th I think there are valuable kind of um, metaphors that you can hang your hat on, or at least get to work on. <laughs> uh, we had a question over there. Yeah.
Yeah, and I think um, Xia Xin Wei, um, there's a, um, a scholar working, he's founded a topology research lab in, at Concordia. He's now at um, Arizona State, but um, he's a mathematician working on these kinds of concepts as well. And he's, he's coming up with new terms to talk about uh, neosemic systems where we're, we're actually trying to devise vocabularies and languages that are of a totally different semic nature to what we've encountered previously, and I find that really useful. Yeah, I wanted to um, ask something about another kind of emergence that seems to be happening on the hinge between performance and visual practices, which is something to do with the kind of critique of the fetishization of liveness. Um, so I think on that hinge you get a lot of practices now that are emerging which are interested in a mixed form of liveness, or even the gap between the live and the mediator, or the live and the not live. Um, so there's a lot of resistance, I think particularly to Peggy Phelan's writing from the marked mm. in the role of the document, um, or, or even the kind of the relationship between the idea of likeness and, and rhetoric of authenticity, uniqueness, presence, and embodiment. Yeah. And I'm curious where you might be in that um, debate. But, I mean, also, I think that's extended out, but there, there is a, perhaps an assumption that greater levels of liveness, greater levels of real time are necessarily somehow more advanced. Mm. And yet there are these models that are much more hybridized. Yeah, yeah. No, that's it's a good point. And I, I think that's that's why something like the Stanyak and Kikut text on uh, deadness mm -hmm. is really useful because I think we are obsessed. We we I don't want to quote the accelerationist manifesto, it drives me nuts, but I, I think we, we are obsessed with this um, kind of catapulting uh, thing that you've referenced in a few of your questions already, uh, faster, quicker, leaner, meaner. Mm -hmm. Um, when uh, Buto can be one of the most powerful communicators of liveness through its stillness, mm -hmm. and you know, w working with people like Tadius Contor on the theatre of death, where he says uh, we 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 read liveness in theatre by putting basically totally mechanised, dehumanised, dead actors on stage, and that makes the audience aware of how how alive they might be. You know, it's and I. I yeah, I think it's I think it's good to be challenging the premises whereby liveness is a superlative that is just kind of strapped onto a bunch of existing a adjectives mm -hmm. because it may be the exact opposite that's required. Alan had a question. I don't mind to ask a question about something that seems to be hiding in plain sight in a lot of the work that we do here. Um, my direction into this, of course, is kind of technologist building. Um, and tangible systems and working with dancers for many years and uh, those, <coughs> those, those experiments clearly challenge the, the attempt to embody our experiences of time through computation but um, one of the things that was uh, most disconcerting in, one of, in a project that I did with Nick actually was where we introduced um, computers into a dance studio in order to provide another layer of abstract thinking about the process what was really problematic for those dancers was the physicality of the devices we'd introduced mm. into, the, into the studio. And I think what hides in plain sight is that we talk about computation as an abstract, whereas in fact every performance we've had here at this conference is more people opening their laps on the stage, and coming and picking yeah. up and down on your keyboard, that gesturally and uh, the, the embodiment of that is, and we all engage in it. But yeah. it's, you haven't shown us any pictures of computers and you haven't said anything about the embodied action of using a laptop or a touch screen or a mobile phone. I wonder if you have any comments about those things. Well, um, yeah, I think I've, sh I think I've shown you one. <laughs> um, if I go right, it's, no, good point and, and agreed. Um, okay, um, lots of computers here, lots of cables. Me and my phone. Uh, sorry? Me and my mobile phone. Yeah, uh, no mobile phones in 94, but um, actually what was really interesting about this first workshop, and it's something that's stayed with me since, so I'm grateful for you to raising that point, is that I, I recruited 15 puppeteers from all over the world, and they were the, they were the best in their respective puppetry techniques. And um, 
they came, they didn't know anything about uh, digital spaces. And they came with these illusions of its uh, unencumbered, joyful, platonic weightlessness and transcendence. And they were confronted with the irritation of what were then very short, so polemus cables, um, really nasty um, primus technical university delft is great but you know this was, this was, these were clunky systems um, calibration t poses forever um, you know and 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 um, the whole we kept all of the computational stuff and in all of the workshops i've done we've kept that stuff very visible because it's it is part of the of the wider performance ecology and and i think um, i think it's really important it 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 does drag it drags on the system, but it can drag in very productive ways. It's not exclusively, to come back to Emma's point, it's, it's not a negative drag necessarily. Coming to terms with the different temporalities of the processes that you're engaging with creatively, um, it can spark a completely different reflection on your own processes. So yes, it is really important. And next time I'll show more slides with messy stuff. <laughs> Well, I think sadly we have to uh, get into the paper session, but that doesn't mean that we have to end right now, because I know there's a question here. Nikolai and the first presenter, you could come up and tell it again if you just yeah. continue. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have a question? Uh, I did. Okay, I'm trying to remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Until, until you're ready. Stephen. Is one of the lessons you have for us that liveness has been in performance all along, and we're just struggling because the particular technologies we've been using, computers, have had this barrier to liveness for a long time. The, the fact that we have to write these programs yeah. and they're difficult to debug, and we're only gradually overcoming it. Sometimes we're in a very no, I'm just testing the sound first. Oh, testing the sound first. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, I think one of the reasons that I started experimenting with motion capture and then worked with people who were using robotics and, and, and stuff on stage is because there was a possibility for deploying uh, huh? computational languages I should be able in, to in hear response something. to uh, slightly more... Uh, Livable, real time. Uh, so it's, it's okay. it is it is re oh, relatively okay. fresh terrain. But I think there's a lot that's this been one? done in the space of a few decades. Um, and I think that live coding performance has a very specific contribution to make to the analysis and the discourse that's building up around those different practices. I'm I'm really really excited by what's going on here. Thank you, Alex. Did you have a last comment? Um, I was just going to ask what um, I think it's so um, it's my question um, about mediatization, what it output? means in a notation driven live we have built an output? Like it's a live internal speaker. Notation. You have an old sound flow. Mediatization mean? You need to do this. Um, if you have mediatization, that, that's li less live in nature. terms of how standard. Um, but live coding is mediatized. So, yeah. am I misunderstanding something? No, I, I mean, um, Auslander was very useful for looking at the traps of playback and the entertainment industry. Mm. I think he did a very good job in 1999. You know, and it's, um, it's just, I the, think it's the just my computer. Scandal, uh, it doesn't these kinds make of sound. Constructs of people who were not really live or who were being presented as something um, that they were not really. There were questions of authenticity like associated um, with let me mass mediatization in the entertainment I industry that are being addressed there. I, th I think that the mediatization that you're talking about and the one that I'm trying to get my head around, but at the moment it's still really, really messy, um, in, in writing, language, notation, syntax, grammar, the, the, the rigors, to use Alan's word, of, of formal structures um, in, in generating something that then operates a, a sweat and blood being, um, it's, it's of a very different order. And I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know whether the liveness that you associate with a with a bit of code is um, is a question of your capacity to read it, to read the liveness in it. It's a literacy question as much as anything for dealing with writing. But. Yeah.